welcome everybody back to Who's Your Band? Uh, I am Jeffrey Paul. I'm joined by Mr. Sean Morton. How are you, Sean? I'm wonderful, Jeffrey. Looking forward to today. Yes, so am I. I really am. Uh, it's been uh, a couple of weeks since uh, we did a show. Uh, we've both been really busy. Uh, both Sean and I have been on the road for a couple of weeks. So, uh, I mean, things are good. Things are kind of back. You know, feel, <laughs> it feels like things are back to normal a little bit, right? Yeah, I'm seeing friends posting uh, videos of them performing at swinger conventions. And I know these, who you're uh, talking about. Yeah, and all these people are uh, going to the porn convention down there, pretending that they're actually interviewers, and all they want to do is just scam free pictures with porn stars. Everything Comedy is back to normal, Jeffrey. It feels that way. Yes. And with being back to normal. Listen, I've been wanting to get our guest on the show for, for a little while now. Uh, I'm a big fan of his. Uh, I'm a big fan of the band he plays in now, but he let's, let's 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 introduce him. He is a bass player. He has been in UFO. He is a founding member of Spread Eagle. He's played with Joan Jett, and he's also touring with one of my favorites of all time, Sebastian Bach. It's my pleasure to welcome into the show, Mr. Rob DeLuca. How are you, Rob? Very good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. No, man, we, we, we're, again, we're happy to have you here. Um, we'll, we'll ease into this a little bit, okay? And then we'll, then we'll hit you up with some cool questions. But, um, Rob, how did you get into music? Um, I think it was just from listening, hanging out with older people uh, who were really into rock when I was a little kid, like 10 years old. Um, I hung out with a bunch of older guys. I was lucky enough to be very influenced by a bunch of older guys. And, you know, it was the big era of, of great bands all out at once, you know, Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and ACDC and Aerosmith and Leonard Skinner. They're all out at once. So uh, it was all around me. So I just, uh, I, after a while, I, I ran into a, a, a couple guys who played guitar, and I was off to the races. Where Where is that? You grew Wilmington, up in Delaware. Okay, cool. So you're not too, not too far, far from. from yeah. Sean is in Jersey. I'm I'm in uh, New York. Okay, so it's not too far. So you're growing up, and what made you decide to get like into a band? Like it's one thing. Like I listened to music. Sean listened to music, but we didn't go on to become world class musicians. How did you get into a band? And how old were you when you first started? I think it's uh, it was just the luck of of seeing some, a friend play guitar and, and realizing not only can I listen to this stuff, I can I can hopefully do it, you know. So there were a couple guys in the neighborhood who played guitar, and I was lucky enough to to be around them. And uh, I guess I was around fifteen at the time. And were you were you in a cover band at the beginning? Uh, probably in the beginning, we probably played cover songs. Yeah, we weren't even, you know, we were not even good enough to play out or anything mm -hmm. like that. You know, just kids in basements. Yeah, but you did. You you're meeting chicks. You're the cool guy in school, right? Is that no, it wasn't even that. Uh, it wasn't even that developed. I, I think uh, I was. Maybe that would have happened. Um, but then I, I went to college. I went to school for music and got even more serious about it. OK, gotcha. And then that stuff happened like after I moved away from Delaware. Uh, listen, uh, in your introduction, you know, I, I mean, I, I know I left out a couple of bands that you've played and you've played with everybody, it seems like. Um, and you've been you when you look at your resume, it looks like you're, you're never not on the road. Um, so the question is, like. What's been the biggest obstacles now touring in this time of COVID for you? Uh, well, just just booking, <laughs> just just uh, I mean, the beginning is just booking and getting something concrete that works during the, the, the pandemic. And then once you get that, I guess it's the, the obstacles are there's less people coming out because um, there's still that you know, slight hesitancy. Um, and, um, you know, I think I hear they're paying artists less, but, uh, but I'm not sure about that. You know, it is, 
has is has it been difficult booking like actual rooms to play in or like when you're looking down the road for future tours like in uh, 2022 uh getting just venues to play because it seems like that's the year that everyone seems to be going out oh no no it's not like it that it's too crowded it's just uh in 22 it seems like just a lot of people are, are a lot more hesitant in 21 about doing this because bands are trying it and then they're getting pulled off the road. Um, there's a lot of startup costs, which you can imagine, you know, sure. you invest in a tour before it happens, you, you pay bus down payments, you may pay some hotel down payments in the beginning, you get your merch in line, um, you get flights. So, you know, if, if it doesn't happen, you can lose a lot, even, you know, even in just for a short period of time, if, if, if you only get going for a short period of time, you can lose a lot of money. Do you find the tours now that uh, a little shorter, like you're booking things in instead of uh, six months down the road, maybe you're booking things just two in two month intervals in case something was to happen? That makes sense. But we were out on the longest tour out of possibly any band I've ever seen. We're out on a 12 week tour right now, um, which is. That's that's the longest I've ever done. Actually, my average I do is probably three to five weeks. Um, but that you know it depends. But this one is twelve weeks, so um, that's quite uh, ambitious. And we're making, and it's just in America, USA. So we're making our way across the country now. Now you're touring with uh, Sebastian now, right? Yes. Sebastian okay. So and, and you're you're playing bass, and you, you know, I mean, it, it's a great band, but. Just in case something happened to you, you got COVID, your guitarist got COVID, your drummer got COVID. Do you have uh, musicians waiting in the wings, whether it be a tech or somebody who's touring with you? Like, so that way you're not losing out on the show? Um, yes, that's been set up in the past just because of personally, because I've been so busy, I might jump off a tour, go to UFO, you know, or vice versa. So I have like understudies set up. So um, we haven't had the conversation. I haven't had the conversation with them about joining just because of COVID, but uh, those people are in place. They've been in place for, for a few years now. So we would make the rounds of calls to all those guys and see who's available. When you watch um, Axel's, uh, you know, uh, and Axel, when you, when you watch Sebastian's uh, set, the, the band, it's like, I can't picture uh, Sebastian playing without Rob in the band. You, you, you've been with him for for well over a decade. Yes. And you just, to me, you seem so, so integral. Like you're kind of like the glue. You Thank almost seem like you're the grown up in the room in that band. <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But I've done it. As I said, I've done it a few times to jump off to not, you know, I would never leave a tour and just go home. But if I have to go out on a different tour, you know, and I, that's the, that's the thing that's difficult making decisions like that and trying to, coordinate you know but uh and sometimes the only way to do it is have understudies in place now this tour is uh doing the 30th anniversary of slave to the grind is that right correct so correct. i think that's one of those records and, and jeff knows I'm a, I'm a big skid row fan since you know i was a little little kid but same i think that's one of those top 10 like best follow-up albums of 100%. any album out there yeah it's a great record and it's fun to play it's 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 a little more Aggressive than the first record. Sure. It's a lot harder to sing for Sebastian. It's oh, much, God, yeah. much harder. More intense screaming. Um, Does and he it's still hit me. that note in uh, Monkey uh, Monkey Business? Uh, he hits he hits the notes really well. He's doing a great job. He really is. I mean, there's there's higher notes than that. I think. I think the end of Quick San Jesus. I'm just oh, going to say time. that. Yeah, there's some ridiculous stuff. So um, he's doing great, and it's fun for me to play a new set. Like uh, we've gone through new sets over the years, but the last handful of years have been like a greatest hits skid row songs, mostly, mm -hmm. you know, set. And so it's a whole new, you know, group of songs to learn and play, which is fun. Now, how are you doing? Are you going just opening up with monkey business and going straight through or are you, no, are you peppering it a little bit? We're, we're, we're skipping around and we still do some songs off the first album just because the records are only like 45, 50 minutes sure. long. So you can't just play a record and leave. You have to do some other stuff. And right. also it makes people happy when they hear 
um, you know, I remember you or Youth Gone Wild or something like that. Right. I mean, you're going to see uh, Sebastian Bach, who is the voice of, you know, he is Skid Row. I mean, th- th- that version that's out now of Skid Row is not Skid Row. I'm sorry. You know, uh, and nothing against the other singer. But I mean, you, you, you're touring out of all the of all the musicians and singers you've ever been with, Rob. You know, where do you rate Sebastian? And, you know, how, how can, can you explain to our audience how great this guy is? Well, as a front man and performer, he's he's up there uh, like nine out of ten, you know, or ten out of ten. He's really incredible. And uh, he just commands any stage he walks onto. And he's a great singer. And um, so, you know, it's it's people should go see these icons while they can you know while they're still at the top of their game i've been saying that for years um i think the last few years has made that a little more clearer of why you know we've lost so many people so many people are aging we lost you know two years of touring pretty much uh you know so that we're, we're all two years older you know so is that why Red Hot Chili Peppers are charging $350 a ticket and then Coldplay are charging $575 a ticket oh for their concerts for next year? I and they're sold out and they're adding a second show? Wow, that's crazy. That's I'm sure crazy. you guys charge the same amount, too, when you play uh, in Philadelphia last night, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Oh, so, yeah. so does Fred Eagle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but you, 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 you guys both stumbled upon something um, with, you know, you, you with Coldplay and, and uh, Rob talk about seeing these icons is and I, I didn't have it on, on what I was going to talk about. But what, Rob, what, what's your opinion on like bands like, and Coldplay admitted to this uh, on Stern uh, a couple of weeks ago about playing with tracks? I am uh, a really strong uh, opponent of it and I was one of the first people speaking out about it because I think we learned about it a few years before the general public understood what it was because we had all these bands opening up for us and and they're playing to a lot of backing tracks so um and hold um, on a second. So, Just so our audience also knows, when we're talking about a backing track, what Rob is saying, he's not just talking about maybe a little uh, a voiceover or a keyboard fill. We're talking about you know someone almost singing with a track, you know, you know, playing with the track, almost like a record and and lip syncing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, usually people, lead singers, are singing live to to backing tracks. You know, it's unless it's Kiss. <laughs> most of the time you know people are singing live but there's and sometimes it's just maybe just a keyboard pad or something to fill it out which is you know that's reasonable that's that's, that's that's an effect you know but when you have you know guitar players taking a solo and there's a non-existent rhythm guitarist playing there and you're looking mm-hmm. at the video the live video and there's where's the rhythm guitar player they don't have a rhythm guitar player or you know just tons of backing vocals you know it's like I, i'm not into it it's it's a it's a whole different animal of what i grew up with uh, of bands right. just taking their songs that they recorded with all those tracks maybe and doing a live arrangement of it that sounds powerful and that their fans are going to like and that's a whole different animal and it's a beautiful thing you know your live arrangement is it should be different you know it's it's a, it's a whole different thing and so the a lot of younger bands, surprisingly, are the ones that use tracks the most. And we found why do out, you find that surprising? Because I would think someone who was older might not be able to do certain things anymore, just of the limits of the of, of the human body. You know, vocals or drumming. You know, and all you know, seventy five year old drummer or something. You know, I mean, I don't know. I just it just seems like the youth. Uh, you know, or it seems like they could, they, they can, they have more energy, you know, they can do more, you know? So anyway, so we, we would have these bands opening up for us on these tours um, and they were all using tracks. And, and after a while, it just, it was just crazy that like most bands are using them these days. So I started talking out about it, that, that I, I don't think it's the right thing to do. It also, I feel it stunts your growth as a musician, as a live musician. You know, if you 
if you don't sound good on something, you're going to figure out how to make it right or you're going to rearrange it, you know, in a way where it does, you can present it in a cool way. And it might not be the same as the album. That's okay. Fans, I think the bands that use tracks aren't giving their fans enough credit that they would appreciate something, you know, being rearranged or whatever is real, you know, and it's, and then you get better because you're like, you, you learn how to rearrange you, you, or you learn how to hit these notes, you know, or play these notes or, you know, it's, it's a process. And I think bands are afraid to fail um, coming out of the gate. They're really afraid to fail. Maybe the in- industry for has, has harbored that in some way. I don't know. Um, but uh, failing sometimes, you know, is a good thing, uh, especially if you make it a, a, a temporary failure and fix it. That's a great, great comprehensive answer to, to, to yeah, that question. That, that really is. Um, you know, Sean and I, like we, we will both, again, we'll go see, you know, Sean is a maniac. He's a beast when it comes to concerts. This guy will go four concerts a week. You know, if he, know. really, you guys, he, he, he's got more concerts scheduled than bookings. Okay? Let me tell you something. I almost flew out to Los Angeles <laughs> for yesterday to go see System of a Down and Corn, right? And I, at us, as of Thursday, I was pricing flights and I could have got tickets and something said, you know what? I can't do it. And then they canceled the system, show. System canceled. And was corn still doing it or no? No, they canceled the whole show. They postponed the whole show. The whole show. Yeah. yeah I, I get back to the one thing. It's like, you know, that's one of the reasons I, I really respect the Foo Fighters is because after the first album, you know, it was really Dave Grohl doing everything. And then like the second album, they're like, all right, we're going to add some more guitars in. Then the third album, they're like, we have a lot of guitars. Let's just add another guitar player to the band. So they got three full-time guitar players in the band. They're not they're not using any kind of tracking at all, you know. Even That's on the great. last album, they have these backup singers, and now they bring them on tour to do two songs. That's yeah. a great gig. Yeah, yeah. But you, but when you, band. they're a great band. But when you go to a concert, you know, I I I don't want to hear it sound like it does on the record. I like the blemishes mm. in it. I yeah. like I, I like I like it being a little different. I don't mind the arrangement. I you know if I'm going to see somebody a little bit older, and that's why I asked about uh, Sebastian hitting the notes. You know I you know I want to see how he's going to adjust with that. I I I worked and I've seen the Stones a bunch of times, and I I worked on four different tours, and I hear different ways Mick would sing some of these songs. Well, they're just you know? changing keys up and things like that. Like Bon Jovi was one of those bands. Like he, you know, he had an amazing voice in the eighties and you know the mid nineties. And like once the two thousands came along, you just can't hit the notes sometimes. Now they're just changing keys completely, and it sounds better. Like you're not forcing it. Like I saw a, a band. I don't want to really like dish, uh, like really like just bash them because I really love this band. Who are they? Um, it's the opposite of Shine Up. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, yeah, the last song and he's running around and then he's singing and he trips and like he, he as he's tripping, he's trying to regain his balance and the microphone goes to his side and he's still singing. See, these bands got to be cool. I can't. I can't. It's, oh, it's, they lose the I, shit I, out of them. Yeah. It was like, it was and, like and I, 100%. So. I, I'm, I'm looking at my friend going, is this really fucking happening? Like, it's like, they were, at that time, they were probably the biggest rock band that was out there. It was right when Sounds of Madness came out. So, like, they were selling out multiple nights, huge places. And I yeah. was just like. It should be what? advertised as like a performance of live and backing tracks or something. Or, you know, in totally. it shouldn't be done, done, at, it it shouldn't like be done at all. Yeah, it really well, shouldn't be done at all. Because if you're still, if, I, if I'm going to see you guys and you're playing to a CD, then why should I even bother come to see you? I want to hear the way you play. I want to hear the I way agree. Sebastian sings. I agree. Some people might disagree with you. And if that's the case, it should be advertised of what you're buying a ticket for. Because- if that's the case, then Rob, you know, then what I can do is, you know, why don't you add me to the band? I look cool. Okay. You don't and look cool play, at all. No, 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 play, no, no, no. Can, I can play with the track and it could be, it could be your, it could be your talent, but I'll look cool up there pretending I'm playing. It, how how yeah. is it any different? That's, that's well, what's good. That's what's going to happen. We're going to have Rob DeLuca, this long haired <laughs> bass playing fanatic. We're going to have Sebastian Bach, six foot three with hair down to his asshole. And let's have Jeff from Staten Island, the account, the accountant looking comic. Let's like do that. Account. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the people are buying tickets. They they know who's on the stage, you know. Um, but the thing is, they don't realize that for years they've been lied to. And this has gone on for years where they've been buying tickets. Thank you. And they've been listening to tr- bands that have enhanced shows. Um, and by the way, Sebastian, we play all the songs in the original key. Really? So, and there's a, yeah. And there's wow, a lot of great. live videos uh, online from this tour. You can see how he's doing. I've seen, I mean, I've seen him up until about probably three years ago and he's still got it. Like yeah, I'm terrified. The whole, the whole I, band, the whole band still has it. Of course, I mean, they, of they, course. They, they look, they look like a cool rock and roll band. I, I, I can't wait to see you guys. I, live. I'm terrified. Like I did not buy tickets for this uh, Def Leppard Molly crew tour. For, it was supposed to be this year and now it's being pushed off to next year i didn't buy it and like i'm seeing the videos and like at some point you just gotta say to you know certain small chubby singers for motley crew uh <laughs> you may have to either lose some weight and and i don't know uh, maybe practice a little bit i think a bring yeah, karate it's back. a shame now he hurt himself you know that, i know that, i was a nasty fall too and i don't think that was his fault from what no. i was hearing about the stage so it's no it's not really at all sad Hey, listen, we've all fallen off stages. Am I right? <laughs> I don't know if I've ever fallen off stage. but right, I fell off three times, times, Rob. Knock it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah we're, showing, we're all not 6'3", 320-pound uh, comedians that fall off stages because we don't have balance. Three um, times. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. You and Coleman Green. Um, <laughs> Rob, who's been the – again, you've been in a ton of different bands. You've, you've toured with legends. Who's been the most fun to tour with? Um, well, probably we've had the most fun with Sebastian opening for GNR. That's just like storybook sure. and really good times. You know, that's what you get into it for. So I, yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that. That was what, 2005? It started in 06, but I think it went up to New Year's Eve, 2011, 12. Now, what, which tour was it when you guys are opening for, uh, GNR that you actually played in the two supporting bands. Yeah, I did. That Think was about probably... how sick that is, Sean. This yeah, guy, he, he 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 was the hardest working guy on this on and on in the stadium that night. <laughs> I didn't really have a choice, but I was fine with that. <laughs> Tell um, us about that. Was about oh nine. It was probably about oh nine. I was in in Helmet and Sebastian's band. You got two paychecks. I don't give a shit. Yeah, do you okay. get two paychecks? Uh, I actually did it for free for Helmet. They were in a jam. Um, they would have paid me, but I did it for free. Uh, they were in a jam. The bass player couldn't get into Canada. Why so, is he the nicest fucking musician we've ever had on this show? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! I want people. I want like I want dirt. I want to hear. No, I was a nice dude. I was a yeah. You know, they were they're good people. I just played for them. Well, you know, you have your you have your dirt episodes, and then you yeah. need some. You need some. Yeah, uh, I guess. So what, what's guess. a dirt yeah. episode? What 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 was, what was like a, like a, you know, what what's some dirt? What what did what did you see on anything? Any, give us something cool. Any, anything give me the worst cool. like the worst groupie story that you've worst ever had. Worst groupie story. Oh, uh, I don't even know. Did, did, you ever, did you ever see Sebastian make out with a guy? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna take that as a yes. Okay. <laughs> Did, it's gotta did, be did, like some sort of like really horrific groupie story. Like it was a girl that you knew, like when you played in Spread Eagle in like '91, and like you knew her, and like she would come to all your shows, and then she'd show up like 25 years later, trying to like say that like you know this is your son over here, and like it's hard to remember that far back, considering you know the, the line of work I'm in. Well, that's true too. It probably was back then those stories, you know. I'm sure. So when you when you when you do. Sebastian's band when you do your you do helmet you do spread eagle uh how long does it take to actually rehearse and have a set down um well for me I'll start like um maybe a week or less before the tour reacquainting myself with the tunes and just if I have time go through them every day once is that what you're asking? No, no. Okay, so like you'll have your part down, but then you don't you eventually have to get together uh, with the band. Oh, and, like how, how, and how long does it take to actually be like tight? We 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 don't rehearse much. On many tours, we don't rehearse at all um, with any of the bands I'm in. Um, Is that the norm? 
it's so expensive, you know, like getting a rehearsal room. You have people from different, a lot of bands now have people who live in different cities. Every band I'm in does. Um, so, you know, you have, you're talking hotel rooms, you're talking rehearsal rooms. So it's just easier just to show up knowing your shit. And like with Baz, we did a rehearsal because we had a new drummer. Um, so we did one rehearsal. Uh, we have a new drummer, Jeremy Colson. And, you know, so that made sense. Just get on the same page with him. But you kind of just have to show up knowing, knowing your stuff. But you could all know your stuff. And then don't, 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 doesn't it all have to, like, be pieced together? And, every, you know, and, like, no one, like, went to actually, like, come in. Like, so it all kind of, like, goes, goes like a full machine. And, like, with comedy, it's all about reps. So it seems like you're doing things for the first time, but it's seamless. Is the same thing hold true with a, with a band that, and putting all the pieces question. together? Yes, there's, that's a really good question. Yes, there's a live set that... We have like segues or Baz might say certain things or he might not say the same thing, but this certain type of thing, or he might say something completely different, but we know he's going to speak there. So what we do is we look at live videos off of YouTube and we, you know, the people, if anyone's new, um, we tell them to, to look at the live videos and they kind of get it. Oh, we're going to take a break here. We're going to do this kind of intro thing here. So yes. Do you, veer, do you veer off your set list at all? Or are you basically playing the same set every night? Um, we are playing two sets. We have a greatest hit set that we, we did in uh, Buffalo at the beginning of the tour. Then we're, now we're doing the, the, um, the 30th anniversary of Slaves, so that's all the same. But then we're going out on the Kiss Cruise and we're going to have a different uh, set, have a couple few sets for that um, involving greatest hits. We'll also do one of the shows will be a, a, a Slave set. Mm-hmm. Is, is Smashing doing any of his solo stuff on the uh, on the tour as well? Hmm. We we used to do American Metalhead for many years. We just pulled that out to to do this um, Slave to the Grind set. Okay. So, really, what's your favorite song? What's your favorite song on the set list right now? Um, I like playing The Threat. I like playing um, Quicksand Jesus. The ballads are fantastic on on yeah. Quick, Quicksand and, and Wasted Time are, are two of the most underrated ballads. Oh, yeah. Quicksand should have been Dark really Room like also. it should have been the single, yeah. and that, yeah. should, that that really should have been the song. That so that's a special song. Ballads, uh, Dark Room, Quicksand, Jesus, Wasted Time. I love they're they're some of my favorite songs to play. They're just fantastic. You know, you you were I like playing you know, monkey business too, and Sweet Little great Sisters song. was fun to play. That's it's such really a fun. great, great, great song. You know that, that the second Skid Row album is so much harder than the first one. Yeah, and, but, but, but there is not a, a clunker in that that album. Um, the, the way I want to ask you, um, you you were in UFO and you replaced, you know, a legendary bass player, Pete Way. Was, did you feel any extra pressure, you know, going into that band, whether it be from the members of the band or, you know, especially the fans? And how did they react to you when, you know, when they would see you on tour? Well, no, because I don't, there's not really a lot of time to think about it that way. You just got to focus on on the music, playing, playing well. And the band were totally, totally cool. They never... You know, like they don't they really, give you shit. No, no, they really love and loved and still love Pete. You know, um, they would. I think they would have liked for him to be there, and it was it was all his doing. You know, and uh, at, when I came in in two thousand and eight, it it was you know very temporary. You know, like well, let's just fix this problem. Pete not being able to get into USA, and and Pete will fix fix whatever he's got going on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but unfortunately he never did. So, uh, it just lasted. So they were really cool. I didn't really have time to think about it that way, the way you described it. Fans, <clears throat> excuse me, fans can be difficult sometimes exactly. because we all know we love our, our favorite bands and we love them the way we experienced them at that time when we got into them, you know, like the original GNR, original ACDC, you know, the original Pink Floyd, you want to see them 
with those members, you know, thank God Aerosmith. There's always a little bit of a hesitancy when there's a new guy coming in. Like I was, yeah. I'm a big Sabbath fan and, you know, it, it, even beyond Ozzy being replaced, do you remember when they replaced Bill Ward with, uh, I think it was uh, Vinny Apice. Vinny Apice. And I was remember like, you know, I don't know about this Vinny Apice. I think he may have been an ELO, you know? So I don't know if he's going to fit no, into Sabbath. I don't think he's in the they, they did replace <laughs> you know, Bill Bilford, uh, right? Uh, Bill, B- B- um, Biff Bilford, something like that. Yeah, right. I'm not sure if that's the name, the right name either. But yeah, we're talking about the right guy. He was in ELO. Yeah, he was a really good friend of Tony's, I think. Um, but uh, um, Vinny is a great drummer and a he really is. nice guy. Um, but yeah, you know, so. There's, you know, there's always going to be a little pushback online um, from some uh, purist fans. And I get that. And that's that's part of the gig. You know, when you take a gig like that, you have to understand that's that's part of it. So it's fine. And of all the bands you played in, if you could only like, you know, have been in one band. What was the band you'd like to be in? Who did you have the most fun with? Like, you know, wh- what was like the most pleasing for you? You could only have picked one band. Who would you, who, who would that band been that you played with? I would say definitely Spread Eagle because the band that you come up with, that you learn how to be in a band with the, the one you make mistakes and learn from them, the one you're a big part of the creation process and of the decision making process and a big part of the image that always stays really special to you. So, you know, even though Spread Eagle didn't reach the heights yet <laughs> um, that, that it should have, uh, it would definitely be that band. Spread Eagle, when you guys came out, your debut album, I mean, critics loved it, right? I mean, that that yeah. was considered one of like the debut albums of, of, a, of a rock band. And then, like, what happens? Like, you know, w- you know, why why didn't Spread Eagle hit the acclaim that you know it probably should have? A lot happened. Um, to quickly go through some of the things, not making excuses because things happen the way they're supposed to. But uh, grunge came in, and it made it hard for any band that was even loosely associated with hair metal as the most uncool thing that ever was. You just say you guys were, I wouldn't say you guys were a hair no, we metal were, band. But we came out during that era. Right. And a lot we of got bands got bumped into that. So yeah. stupid. So stupid. So that's one thing. Um, uh, what else? We made a, our second album, which is incredibly musical and, and really interesting. It confused our fans a little bit because we got lighter and uh, we tried some different, different kind of styles. Um, and some of our fans loved it, but a bunch of our fans didn't because they wanted us to stay heavy because other bands were after us were, were coming out heavy and heavy was starting to get more popular in, in, in the mainstream, like, uh, Pantera, you know, Cowboys from Hell came out and Priest came back out with Painkiller. And, um, a year after us, uh, Skid Row came out with Slave to the Grind. They got heavier, you know? Um, so, you know, we, but we couldn't see the we couldn't predict the future you know Um, why did you guys go in that direction because the first album didn't sell as much as mca wanted it to sell and then everyone started questioning everything and we had everyone giving us an opinion of what we should do instead of just you know again it's an incredibly musical album that a lot of bands wouldn't be able to make back then um do you regret the decision I regret some, um, I think we should have stayed heavy, uh, maybe even gotten a little heavier, but I'm not going to single out anyone and say, oh, I said that and they didn't, you know, I was just as as confused as anyone. Right. Um, You know, you have bands like Warren, you know, just blowing up with with their their ballads, you know, their love ballads. And it was a confusing time, you know, and then, you know, plus grunge, plus, uh, um, uh, you know, we were growing up, we didn't have a dime to our names, you know, and that was like scary. And, you know, you it, it makes you make decisions, not the best decisions sometimes. And 
drugs started creeping in for some band members. So it was a lot of things at once. Uh, it really was a lot of things at once. It, it sounds to me a little bit like the record label put a lot of pressure on you guys. Like the, the, we, you know, they're, they're seeing the market, how the market is kind of changing and they're telling you maybe this is the direction you ought to go into. And like you said, like, you know, what kind of leverage do you really have? You want to continue to be financed. You want to be able to go out on tour. You want to be able to make money and you kind of compromise, even though deep down you, it's not the right, the right move for the band. Uh, well, that's in hindsight, though. You know, right. we didn't know it wasn't the right move for the band. I'm sure there's also a lot of people getting in your your ear. Yeah, absolutely. But to answer your question, I'd say the initial opinion probably came from the record company. Um, but I will take full responsibility that I didn't know better or didn't stand up to that. Do those problems still exist today with the uh, record company? Because the record business has changed so dramatically from when you guys first started. I would think they probably do. Really? I think they probably do. Because it, it seems business, like it's, you know, it's a business. Yeah, well, it's and a business that's giving it's, you money. It's a business that's changed. You know, I mean, it, it, back in the back in the day, you know, you would go on tour to support your your record. Now, right, and now you go, you go, you'll go, you'll put out a record and almost put it out for free to let you know, so people could, would come and see you. So you'll make your money on touring or on merchandise or a combination of both. So right. the, I think to, the you business to tour to support an album. Now you put an out, out an album to support a tour. Exactly. Right. Bingo. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, I just took the world's longest route to say it. Yeah. You know? Basically. Yeah. I'm the editor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and and that's the reason why, like, like my jokes are so long winded and like, you know, the audience is falling asleep. But by, by, by the time right. get, you, go, you go outside, you go get a drink, you go to the bathroom, you call, you call the babysitter, you see the ba- the kids. OK, you go back inside, you have a smoke and Jeff is still on the leading <laughs> for the joke. Right. And, and and the punchline is I still can't stand my wife. But, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and they call it the aristocrats. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Rob. Uh, rank these three bass players, okay? Um, Steve Harris, John Antwistle, and Chris Squire. Well, you know, my opinion, uh, you know, who knows what it means, but I would say in order of, first, it's got to be Antwistle because he, he was one of the early guys influencing a lot of bassists to to be as creative as he, as he was, you know, uh, he came, you know, the who must've come out in maybe 63, 64, you have to remember. So to be that courageous on, on a base back that far back, I'd have to put him at number one. Um, and, uh, I know there's a lot of Iron Maiden fans, fans out there. And I've, I'm a huge, uh, I've huge res- respect for, for, um, for Iron Maiden, but I'm going to pick Chris Squire second. Why Chris Squire second? Because I was a big Yes fan when I was a kid. Ah, there you go. I really was. I I I, I don't play like that because I wasn't playing bass at the time. But um, I, I would probably say that that Steve Harris is probably rightfully second, though influence, influentially. Um, but to me, I would pick Chris second and Steve third. He played Chris Squire. Did he play like a fretless bass? Uh, not that I know of, but he might have. No, I don't. I, don't know, I kind of thought that. I thought that was kind of like a weird thing. That seemed like it would be a very hard thing to well, do. On on his solo album, he played all um all kinds of different bases, so I'm sure he did. Oh, Ron yeah. Paul from uh, Guns N' Roses back in the day would play uh, fretless guitars too, which, which bl- blows my mind because like yeah. whenever I pick up a guitar, I have to look. I feel like this. I have to look at every <laughs> single note that I'm playing, yeah. and this guy's just like way on like this. I'm like, I, I can't stand this son of a bitch. I really yeah. can't. He's he's just too good. I, I, don't you hate that? You don't you hate when a musician is like you really really? He's too that's good. what I hated Tool for so long. I really despised Tool for so long because like I'm listening to all these like time changes and all these, and I'm like, these guys are too good that I can't stand them. I can think like that, like Tool with all the odd meters and stuff. I can think yeah. like that, but like Ron Paul. I saw Dream Beyond. 
I saw Dream Theater one time at a concert in Long Island. There was about a thousand people and uh, four chicks at the show. Let's just get that out of the way for Dream Theater. <laughs> it's all it's all nerdy musician dudes who are standing there. And I'm looking, I'm like, wow, Petrucci is playing this amazing solo. And it was the keyboard player. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm done. I went to the bar. I, well, I, the bar. I, drank, I drank the rest of it. <laughs> Can't take that shit. Hey, Rob, do you like Rush? I do. I do. Uh, I um I really liked the 2112 album and moving pictures when I was a kid. Um, I'm not like into everything they they've done, like a lot of people around me, but I, they're, they're amazing. They were and are amazing. Sean hates rush. Yeah. I hate rush. Uh, and I hate Primus as well. I'm not a See, Primus I fan. The Frizzle here's the Fly thing. album by Primus is pretty damn awesome. All right, right, look, there's some good songs by Primus. There's some decent songs by Rush. Not my two favorite bands. Let's just get that out of the not way. Not mine either. And then this summer, Primus goes on tour doing a Rush set. <laughs> my friend calls me and says, I have an extra ticket. Do you want to go see Primus doing the For All Kings uh, Rush album? I'm like, I would probably rather get a colonoscopy from Freddy Krueger than ever go to that concert. I think the only thing worse than you going to that concert would be you in a fantasy football league. Yeah, no, I, I like pussy. I don't, I don't. Yeah. I don't Sean know. doesn't like fantasy football. No, no. Um, Rob, who did you listen to growing up? I mean, like what, what, what were bands that like you, that really like turned you on? Do you remember like maybe the first record you bought? I think the first record my mother bought me was Close to You by the Carpenters. Uh, they're great. How great oh, yeah. was she? Fantastic. And she she played drums, too. A great um, drummer. Yeah. But um, and I then I kind of then I heavily got into like the Beatles and Elton John, um, which is a sensibility that I still carry with me. I'm glad I got into those those artists. Um and then I saw Kiss Alive in the record store on an end cap. Kiss Alive One? Kiss Alive One. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I told my mom, I probably went there to buy like an Elton John record or something. I said, I want that, you know. But um, to be honest, I wasn't into Kiss for that long because then I heard Aerosmith. And, you know, this can be argued for days, but... To me, something about Aerosmith was so much sexier. The groove was, you know, Big time. it wasn't as stiff. And and um, I like the lyrics more. I, I, I like the image more, the bad boy image, as opposed to the makeup. Um, so I wasn't into Kiss for very long and then, and when, when I discovered Aerosmith. And then it was just like hard rock. I, Pink Floyd are probably my favorite band. But um, I stared at the... Highway to Hell ACDC album cover every day and played it every day when I got home from school. Um, GNR, you know, when that came out, just blew my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and I yeah, saw like that every people. tour from that first tour, GNR, um, all the way up till when Buckethead joined. I saw every tour. So, you know, just and all the big rock stuff from, from the late 70s and 80s, you know, um, like I said, Skinner and Zeppelin and Alice Cooper, all, you know, I was just a big hard rock guy, you know, I, I, I liked the nasty rock and still do. All right. So besides the Carpenters, because you can't say the Carpenters now, then what would, okay. What would be a guilty pleasure of Rob DeLuca? Like on your playlist, on your, on your phone, when you're in the gym or if you're, 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 you're driving, you're going to put on something. And if we found out about it, we'd rip you apart from just so be honest. What is, what is like the one, that one guilty pleasure? Well, probably Elton John, you know, I don't think that's a guilty pleasure at all. I think that he's, he's so brutally underrated. Um, unless as far as, as, as an island girl. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, as long as it's an influence, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, I literally well, bought tickets. With the light man's world. I knew every word of every terrible song. song it's a when I was terrible a song. Yeah, it's right. not a great. If he, if, listen, I just spent $300 on tickets to see Elton John next July. If he plays that fucking song, I'm walking out. <laughs> hey, I, I think you're going to be safe. He's not going to do that song, but he's doing A Farewell to Kings by Rush. <laughs> God, I, I might sit through that. If it's Elton, I might sit through it. He's not only doing front. side one, though. That's fine by me. That's fine so, by me. That's a, so that's a, I'm 45. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pee break. That's a pee break for me now. You know? 
Um, um, I'm not sure. I'm not evading the question. I just, <laughs> you know, I try not to listen to much music when, oh, I know what. You might not think it's, you, you might not hate me for it, but I listen to a lot of uh, uh, Motown, 70s Motown. No, I, we respect the shit out of you for that. Yeah, I love that's what I'm Jackson saying. Five. I can't think of anything that, like that. I'm not really into, I hate pop music. Like Sean uh, loves Taylor Swift. Listen, all right, you want to talk? Here's what this is what I just uploaded to my phone. Okay. Now, I've admitted that in the past, if I ever die, unfortunately, in a car accident, if they grab my phone, they're going to think I'm a sociopath. But that's totally fine. I have no problem with that. Uh, Blackstone Cherry, Melissa Etheridge, the new Billy Idol, Daughtry, the new Candlebox, which, by the way, probably album of the year. Just want to get that out of the way. Uh, the new Guns N' Roses Hard School, which honestly can't stand it. That's good. Um, band that we just interviewed, Tempt, uh, Lady Gaga, Imagine Dragons, The Killers, Billie Eilish, and the new Iron Maid. Hmm. A little diverse. I did hear uh, one of the Candlebox singles, Go, Take Me Down or something like that. Something I believe that's it. Yeah. It's a lyric like that, a title, something like that was very good. It's a great record. I don't know much about the band. Believe me, I, I heard the singles back in the nineties. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not. They're not, the they're lot, not breaking but... the. They're not breaking the format, but it, it's a really solid, really solid song. record. Yeah. Which one? You want to have Mammoth on there? Yeah, that's further down. I just uploaded these. Okay, that's a great record too. That's very good record. That's that, that's what it could be my record of the year this year. What is it? Mammoth. 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 Eddie's Mammoth. Kid. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's so talented. Like, see that style. I'm, I'm a big fan, but that style, I'm a, I'm a fan because of him, not because he's Eddie's son, just because everything he's been through, um, you know, with his dad passing away and him, you know, getting all the hate and, and just going out there, standing proud mm -hmm. and being able to sing and play like that. So even though I'm not a big fan of the genre, I've watched live videos and he doesn't use tracks. He's very clear about that. That's right. And it's so good. Like it's, he does sound like the album because he's that talented. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't have to rearrange it for a It's a great band. All. It's a great he's, band. He's a monster, monster musician. And I, I'm glad he's getting all the success that he's getting. And I do love the fact that he handles his internet trolls very, very well too. Like all the first well. one, he just said, look, look guys, I'm not fucking playing Panama. That's what it comes down to. I'm not doing it. They're like, honor your father. And he goes, I am honoring my father. I'm playing out, doing what I love for a living and making great music. Yeah. And the other day they were like, how dare you use the name Van Halen in your band? And he goes, it's my fucking last name. <laughs> why would you want to go see, honestly, why would you want to go see him do Panama? I wouldn't. Neither would no. I. I mean, no, his music that. stands on its own. I mean, yeah, unless he did something course. different, unless he did something different where like they decided to get Van Halen back together, some miracle, right? David Lee Roth is now retired, but Sammy wants to come back. Michael Anthony says they'll play bass. And then Wolfie says, you know what? I'll play yeah, guitar. Cool. Then it's different. Then it's a completely different ball game, but there's no. And you need. have to have Alex playing drums. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, what's going on with David Lee Roth? Do you guys know? No, I don't. He retired. He officially He's retired. Playing, did you hear that statement? Yeah, yeah, that he didn't exactly. open up for a band that he influenced. No, yeah, it's, no there was there was some ominous stuff in that. Did you hear it, Rob? Yeah, he said that my doctor is advising me not to. But then he said something like the end, you know, the end of the road, whatever. Yeah, like I'll be seeing you soon, Eddie. Something like something weird like that. But not in parentheses or something. So that's strange. Knows? Who knows? Yeah. Maybe he's sick. Maybe he's sick and just not saying it. That could be it too. He, you know, he, he he doesn't look great either. You know. Oh, and have you I, seen a mirror, Jeff? <laughs> he looks a lot better than you. Believe me. Uh, listen, I think at this stage in our lives, I, I think I've surpassed uh, the for every for every growing up. David Lee Roth has has destroyed me in every part of my life. I think now I got him. Okay? <laughs> you got him now. I, I got him now. At, at, at all these stage. years. Um, hey, Rob. Do you like the road? Do I like the road? Yeah. You're on a 12 week tour. You said, do you enjoy the road still at the stage in your life? Yeah. I mean, when you get on stage and you're playing in front of people, it's, it's really uh, worth all the toil that it takes to get to that point. It's tedious though. You know, it's basically there's 21 and a half, 22 and a half hours where you're just 
gone through bullshit to get up on that stage. So true. You know? I used to do weeks at casinos all the time and people would be like, you know, oh my God, that's a great gig. I'm like, no, it's really not because I'm only working 20 minutes to a half an hour a night. Uh, I could be a degenerate gambler and I got to spend 23 and a half hours in a freaking hotel room and at a casino because I can't control my, my freaking slot machine urges. Yeah, they're smart. They book you in there. They give you free rooms. They pay you, and they expect you to lose all the money back. Basically, what it is. So, what do you what do you do to occupy your time? Me, um, I built a vintage base website called vintagebaseworld.com. That literally took me ten years to build. It's like four hundred web pages and tens of thousands of pictures of vintage instruments. So and you built it. I did. Well, I, I had someone you were a smart guy. physically build it, but I, I built all the 100% of the content. And uh, I, did, I built some of it too physically, but I had a, a webmaster in Germany help me with it. It's called Vintage Base World, and it's the biggest um, vintage instrument site in the universe. That's, now, that's, that's amazing. Sell, or is it just like to... Uh... No, it's free. It's for yeah, This is the Nice Guy podcast, remember? <laughs> that's next week. But uh, yeah, it's it's just an information website for That's people cool. who uh, you know want to check to see if their instrument is all original or whatever, or if they're going to buy a, an instrument and don't want to get ripped off. Um, so it's pretty cool, vintagebaseworld.com. And then other than that, I uh, I do a lot of juicing. I juice for my crew, uh, bring them juices in the day, and this is uh, crisis, this guys. I work good out guy. a little bit, um, you know. So basically, so basically you build now let me ask you this now, now spreading came out in 19 what 90 yes okay so can you imagine like having a time machine right and going forward to 2021 and that's going back 30 years later and like you're talking to like slash and slash goes hey what's the future like as he's doing like a rail of coke off a stripper's ass and you're going <laughs> well you know uh here's some kale juice <laughs> yeah, I probably would not. It wouldn't work, right? It wouldn't work. I would work. probably not think that I would be that person. No. But, uh, but you got to sustain out here. You know, it's that's very true. easy to get no, sick. And that's not even talking about COVID. It's very easy just to get a nasty flu or whatever and really hurt. You know, like we all sing a lot. You know, I sing a lot. And, uh, you know, you're trying to keep yourself healthy. You know, it's 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 hard when you're traveling like this. It's a, it's a weird lifestyle when you like we, we've only done like, you know, I've done a couple of weeks on the road. Jeff's done the same thing, too. It's it's hard because like you want to like you said, you want to make sure that your craft is doing really well. So like you can't go out and drink until 430 in the morning. I used to, gonna, but but not we all any- did. We yeah. all did. Now, it, I, one of the jokes, and, and I hate doing this, but like one joke I used to do was like people would ask me, is like, oh my God, you're in a casino for a week. I mean, are you doing, are you doing drugs? Do you have hookers? Do you have, you know, you're drinking your face off? I'm like, no, I watched 13 episodes of This Is Us and I ate a whole bag of Oreos. Like, that's exactly <laughs> what I did the first week I was at the Borgata in Atlantic. I did nothing. I did absolutely nothing because you want to save yourself for that moment here on stage. Yeah. God yeah. forbid you to write a new joke. <laughs> <laughs> but and you know if you don't play well perform well whatever you do it's a downer because it's the sure. whole reason you're out here you know Maybe and, if back. and if and if you know they might not invite you back and and if it's because of something like health that's very d- disappointing you know Jordan, have you noticed it's like we get bass players on and the, 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 the prerequisite, the bass player has to be the nicest guy in the band. We had, uh, we have Billy Sheenan on. Remember Billy Sheenan? Oh God. That was great. Okay. And yeah. He was just like this awesome guy. Amazing. You know, doing what you do, giving back, giving lessons, you know, completely accessible, you know, is why, why is it, why is it about the bass player? Like the, I guess the, the lead singer is the pretty boy. He's getting, he, he's fucking everything in sight. And the lead, the guitarist could be right. Yes. Sean is the lead singer. Okay. The guitarist could be like the asshole. You know, he, he's got, he's got the lead. He could look cool, but the bass player and the drummer, they're the guys who are like the salt of the earth of these bands. Shouldn't drummers be the crazy guy hitting things for a living? You would you yeah. would think that, but the drummers we've had on this show, like Liberty DeVito was like amazing. Like, like such a cool guy. Bl- Blas Elias, Blas Elias from Slaughter, 
who, who'd been on the show. I mean, the guy was like, you know, he was in Slaughter. He plays in Blue Man Group. He was, you know, he was he's touring with trans Siberian Orchestra. But he took time off, like, to take his kids to school for 17 years, you know? Well, it, maybe, maybe these people, maybe it's not so much like they're the bass player or drummer. Maybe they're just happy because what they wanted to do their whole life, they're doing yeah, they got the fucking publishing is what it is. That's why they're happy. <laughs> no, but now I just understand why Rob, he started as, as, um, as a guitar player and became the bass player because he, he was too nice of a guy and he had to become, he just fit the mold. He had Maybe to become I the bass player. I did start out as a guitar player for a couple of years, few years, yeah. Yeah. What's the coolest thing about being a rock star? Um, well, people want to talk to you, ask your opinion <laughs> on things. This is pretty cool. You get to listen to their jokes. <laughs> He said, "People think, come up to you after sh- uh, after shows and like but they, yeah, they, but now with COVID, you can't even talk to them. Really, so, it's true. I, I saw it, pictures from Comic Con. You do. I mean, oh yeah, you know, I saw pictures person. from Comic Con with John Cena, who's like one of the biggest wrestlers of all time. Now he's a huge Hollywood star, and like I'm seeing people posting pictures from Comic Con. I'm like, wow, that's kind of like." He's like really, really close to them. I'm like, and then I looked closer and there was a huge eight foot plexiglass barrier in between them that you could barely, barely see in the picture because it was so thin. I wish we had that because yeah, I would like to talk to these people. It's Are so you sh- not doing meet and greet, Rob? No, no. I'm not it's going smart. to the it's table. Smart, I'm not though. doing meet and greets. No. not doing anything. But some bands uh, are. Yeah, Sebastian's not. Um, yeah, we're just. Uh, I think it's a smart thing. I really I do. do. You know, I mean, I, if someone wants to disagree with me, I'm fine with that. You know, but I have my opinion on all this stuff and uh, and I'm being safe. I've had a lot of friends who died. You know, I'm being. Oh, sure. You know, that's when to me, that's when it's really easy to make the right decision for me. If exactly. my friends are dying, I know what I'm going to do. You know, yep. I agree 100 percent. So. Uh, so I would have answered your question is, you know, me, you know, not just taking a couple minutes to talk to people, you know, like giving everyone a little bit of your time, just saying thanks. And just, it's nice to know that you do something that means so much to them. And, and, you know, um, that's definitely one of the best things and that will come back eventually, but it's not here right now. But another thing is being on stage and just seeing how many people are smiling at once. Like it's, it's, it's really like joy that we're bringing these people. I mean, it really is just a sea of people just like you know it's it's pretty cool i mean there's much worse things in in life than providing that service you know if you weren't a rock star what would you have done done would you been a teacher or something i think i'd probably be maybe like a brewmeister a beer someone (laughs) oh you're not one of those like craft beer ipa guys are you not not too much but i think i could get into that whole world of just Doing that, not just with the IPAs, but all beers. All you don't beer. put fruit in your beer, do you? What's that? You don't put fruit in your beer, do you? No, I do not. Good. Okay. <laughs> no, that that, that, that that that's a game changer. That's, Can I ask uh, my famous uh, question now, Jeff? Yes, Sean. We're going to close on Sean's famous uh, question. I ask everybody this question who's in a band. And I've only gotten three. I think people. it's going to be hard to get an answer out of Rob. Oh, you're not, I'm not getting anything out of this guy. I can tell you right now. <laughs> I've had three people give me honest answers. Now, you can pick any band, right? You're, you're picking your band, okay? Anything, living or dead, who is your band that you're playing in? You can play guitar or bass. doesn't make a difference to me. Or you can sing. I don't care. Um, I would say GNR. So everybody in GNR, you just step right into it. I, I like him. I said the same thing. I want to be Izzy Stradlin. I don't want to be Axel. I sure as hell don't want to be Slash. I want to be fucking Izzy in, in 87, 88. That's exactly who I want. If you can take one drummer of Living and Dead, who, who could have been in, in the Rob DeLuca band, who would it, it would have been uh, who? Steven Adler? Cozy Powell. Okay. And who would be your one uh, guitar player? Um, Angus. And who, okay, you would be the bass player. Who is your singer? Oh, uh, definitely Bon Scott. Definitely Bon Scott. That's a great pick. I think he, I think people completely forget about Bon Scott because 
Brian Johnson was so iconic too, but people don't realize how amazing Bon Scott really was. Well, the yeah. reason why that is that, you know, ACDC was never as big as they were with Brian Johnson. More people probably think that Brian Johnson was in, in the band before Bon Scott they, or there ever was a Bon Scott. They were just ascending when Bon Scott passed away. Yeah. What I, did saw they- them, I saw oh. them with Bon. Did you really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. What did you think? I, of that? I, I was in Wilmington, Delaware, and I only knew two people in the whole world who knew who knew who ACDC were before me. Think how crazy that is. No one knew, and it's exactly what you're saying. No one knew about ACDC, um, and we had gotten some. Uh, me and a couple guys heard some import albums, you know, and they were just starting to break through, and then. Um, Highway to Hell came out. That's it. And they were out on tour with Ted Nugent. We went to see them at the That's Spectrum, right. and then he was dead shortly after. And, and but then, you know, after he dies, then the back catalog comes out, and then people rediscover all all the the stuff. Um, yeah, but more than that, it's what you said. It was back in black that just right. you know went through the roof, and you know. I mean, give, right. give the band credit. You know, they they, sure. they they kept working and they got it even bigger. What do you think of, the, uh, of uh, Axel filling in for Brian for that little period? He did a great job, man. It's, you didn't feel like it was like a like a like a weird dynamic. No, I mean, I think that I respect your opinion, but I think that's people having preconceptions. If you think of how high that singing is and how well he performed it. I think he did. I give him an A plus. I thought he was great. In. Yeah. No, I thought he was great. I really did. But it was one of those things where we had tickets and we saw him. And I was like, this is amazing because I'm a huge GNR, my favorite band ever. You can see behind me, I got the flag. My favorite band of all time. I love Axel, you know, and then he comes out and he starts doing the stuff. And it's like two songs are really into it. And then three and then four and five and like six were like, eh, all right, this is good. And that's like the seventh song. We're like, all right, yeah. Now we're like, if we leave now, we can make it home before anybody. And we left like seven songs in. Really? Oh, yeah. I, really, I felt I, at some point I started feeling like it was like an ACDC tribute band with Axel singing, even though it was the band. Right. I, I don't right. know. I thought you know, it was great. When I think well, of ACDC, you know, I mean, it, you, it, there is a replacement singer, you know, you, I, I see what you're saying, but. Uh, to me, Axel sounds more like Bond than, than Brian. And I agree. Uh, and yeah, definitely. I thought he did fantastic. I really, I really. I, I, I my favorite song with, with uh, Bon Scott in the band, and I don't know if singers could be as cool singing the song. Remember the song Sin City? Yeah, mm-hmm. Sin City. Love that. Yeah. One. Uh, yeah that, that, right. Just think about how cool the phrasing and how cool, just how cool that song was. That's a rock star song. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah. Rob, what do you have uh, coming up? Well, um, the, the Bach tour runs until basically Christmas, uh, December 17th. And then I start on the new Spread Eagle album. Awesome. Well, in, in December when I get home. And are you a contributing and, songwriter on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And oh, I'm producing beautiful. it also. And then will, and, you, uh, will you guys be touring in uh, uh, 2022? Yeah, yeah. Red Eagle. Yep. And then I have uh, the final UFO shows where they're they're um, retiring. They're doing June. I think it's June or July. I think it's June in Europe and October in Europe. And they're done in the United States? And right now they don't have anything booked in the U.S. So they probably they, won't. They may it sounds like. Yeah. Rob, this has been a great episode, man. We really appreciate you, Thank you. Uh, coming and t- spending an hour and, you know, chatting with us, man. You're one of the nicest guests we've ever had. Yeah, you're too nice, Rob. You're too nice. Very, very be nice. Seriously, be a little yeah. bit of a dick. Yeah, he's a great musician. Just played yeah. with everybody. 35 and, and, years and in the game. What do I have to be pissed off about? That's true, too. I don't know. What do we have to be? Yeah, yet we're, we're miserable. Well, I got to deal with you once a week. <laughs> That's the problem. That's, on yeah. that note, Rob, thank you I so much for coming so. We really do appreciate thank your you time. And guys, we'll catch you next week with a new episode of Blue Japan. Thank you for following. Take care, everybody. See you guys. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.